from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. On January 6th, the New York Public Library gave a big gift to the world. We enhanced access to 187,000 items in our digital collections that we had determined were in the public domain, providing high-res uh, downloads, our very best quality available for everyone to download and enjoy, including so many treasures from our collections, including photographs from uh, Bernice Abbott documenting the changing, um, sorry, changing uh, New York City landscape, cyanotypes of algae from Anna Atkins. Uh, this is the first photographic work uh, known to be published by a woman. Photographs from the Farm Security Administration, prints from the Works Progress Administration, maps, so many maps, uh, over 20,000. Um, this is a Bromley map from the 1920s uh, showing the landscape of you know, where our workplace is at the New York Public Library. 16th century Japanese scrolls depicting the tale of Genji. And stereographic images, this one showing a view from the Capitol building uh, pointing northeast. So a, a lot of great stuff. But this, this offering, um, it wasn't easy to do. It posed some challenges for us. First of all, let's just be honest, 187,000 is not a sexy number. Um, it's not a million. Um, we also weren't the first to do this. So many of our peers in the worlds of like libraries and museums had been there before. Um, and uh, we knew we were not kind of doing something brand new. And um, also, this is a heterogeneous uh, collection of materials and uh, copyright designations. And the public domain section was just you know, one sort of aspect of that broader collection. So we knew that we needed to figure out a way to bring um, this offering into sharper focus. We need a set of strategies um, to really launch this properly. And we developed these strategies really um, coming, coming from the work that we do in NYPL Labs, which is the team that sort of headed up the release. We're responsible for digitizing the library's collections, and we believe that digitizing our collections and providing access to them is a really important first step, but not the last step. We know that the magic really happens when those materials get into the hands of users and they can create, use them to create new things. Before I get into this uh, story more fully, um, let me uh, introduce uh, our speakers. Um, myself, I'm Shana Kimball. I'm the Manager of Public Programs and Outreach at NYPL Labs and with Josh, uh, co-led uh, this project to release our public domain items. And, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, and uh, this is Greg Cram, Associate Director of Copyright and Information Policy at the New York Public Library, and uh, Josh Hadra, the Deputy Director of Labs, and like I said, my co-conspirator in this project. I'm gonna hand it over to Josh now. Okay. Yes, I'm Josh, Deputy Director in NYPL Labs. Uh, the three of us are the ones up here doing the song and dance and telling you about the PD release that we did, but this is obviously the work of dozens of current colleagues, but um, some of the ways we think about it is this is, in some ways, the work of all of the people who have worked at NYPL, right? Preserving, gathering, preserving, making available all those assets since 1895 um, up to today. Uh, so, I don't know, I haven't counted them, but hundreds if not thousands of people. So, uh, to give you kind of an overview of the program that Shana and I and Greg uh, were working on. Uh, we broke it out into four, couple, four different sections. Uh, the first covering kind of the, the raw interface updates um, and the way that we made the images available through our digital collections platform. Also some of the API updates and GitHub repository release that we did to make the data available. Um, but also some of the rights work that uh, Greg and his team worked on to uh, make it really easy to know which materials were available for use and reuse. And then kind of the last piece that really tied it all together, that really made it appealing. I called it the honeypot, right? Setting it out um, and making it desirable for people to uh, use the materials and incorporate them and put them back into the culture. So to start, this is our digital collections platform. Um, I'm very proud of it. We're all very proud of it. Uh, I actually spoke at DPLA Fest 2015 to a similar group of you all uh, about our then newly revised digital collections platform. And we had undertaken kind of a wholesale uh, rewrite of, of the interface and how we made the images available and the metadata available. Um, for the January release, we were able to uh, update the interface once more. Uh, and this time really put a lot of energy on the specific engagement around the public domain materials. Um, so uh, figuring out ways to surface 
just the assets that are available in high res uh, and get people to click on the download link so that they could use them. Uh, there's a little kind of interaction video here that shows you um, the search filtering that we put in front and center on all the different pages. Um, let's see. So the search filter for the public domain materials is front and center, um, highlighted green so that people wouldn't miss it. Uh, and then once you get to the asset page, um, we really called out all of the derivative types that we had available uh, and put those front and center along with the right statement um, that makes it really obvious which materials are able um, to be downloaded without, without any kind of restriction. So beyond that, uh, we also made some improvements to the underlying um, infrastructure. So by volume, that interface is, is the mechanism by which the most people were accessing our assets, right? Just viewing them, getting at them from Google results, um, all sorts of ways, social media. But there are a lot of developers and other sorts of folks who, who want to kind of get bulk access, right? They want to drink from the fire hose of, of data um, and public domain materials. So we uh, took a crack at revising some of the endpoints in our digital collections API that we first made available in 2013. Um, we were able to update the documentation, and uh, our colleague Sean Averkamp was here yesterday at, at the hackathon working with folks and making, um, making some recommendations about how it could be used uh, and showing off some of the newly revised documentation, including uh, a filter that we were able to put on that limits uh, all the queries um, to just public domain materials. And the reason that's useful is because in the API, wherever possible for the public domain materials, we have in the capture responses direct links to all the derivative types that we have um, up to the archival TIFF um, that is the largest and highest resolution version that we have for these materials. So that was great, that was good work. Um, but then there was a third class of folks that uh, we, we started to think about um, wanting to get access to the data and maybe weren't really ready or willing to, out of the gate, do some software development and some coding to um, access the API. And for those folks, um, we put together a, a release and put it on GitHub, following the footsteps of colleagues in the GLAM community, like MoMA and the Cooper Hewitt. Um, we took a snapshot of our data. So this is um, a set of records that's just our public domain material. Um, we put up item level records and collection level records in CSV and JSON formats for folks who maybe are more comfortable in other tools, like opening it up as a spreadsheet and just sorting at different sections as columns. Um, and there was one other small component of that GitHub release uh, where we put a couple of example scripts and utilities just to, again, sort of prime those engines and give people examples of the kind of things that they can use to interrogate the data that we made available through GitHub. Um, so we put all that work and all that release and, and, and made it available on January 6th, but um, wouldn't really have been possible if we hadn't had some really clear and unambiguous um, right statements, right? Some, some really clear signals about which materials were available for use and how they were available for use. Um, and Greg is gonna tell you all about how we did that. So my story at NYPL begins with this date, uh, 1923. Um, NYPL had been digitizing material for 10 years before I arrived at the library, before my position had even been created. NYPL was digitizing book plates from books published primarily from 1923 because they thought that was safe and comfortable. Um, and as Morris said this morning, it's become apparent that having a digital library that ends at 1923 was not sufficient for today. We wanted to expand our digitization efforts and break through this 1923 barrier. That means that we need to take advantage of the exceptions and limitations in copyright law, but we also need to understand the contours of the public domain. And that's where I come in. Uh, I was hired just over five years ago at NYPL, and I helped manage the institution's risk by gathering data about our items, analyzing it, and recording it uh, to describe how we can use each asset. Expanding the scope of digitization meant taking on some risk, uh, admittedly, uh, of copyright infringement, and that risk isn't something to be taken lightly. Uh, statutory damages are up to $150,000 per work infringed. Digitizing 10 items and hitting that uh, elusive, that, that uh, magical number is 1.5 million in potential damages. We don't digitize 10 items at a time, we digitize in the thousands. So digitizing 1,000 items and getting copyright uh, wrong would be 150 million in, in the worst, absolute worst case scenario. So those numbers get really scary really quickly when you're talking to a, a board of library directors. Um, so because these stakes were so high, they, the libraries needed to do the research necessary to understand and accept these kinds of risks. 
So after all that research was done, is done about these assets, um, the question was how do we make this research actionable? So we began looking for pre-built rights databases that where we could input the data and have it control um, downstream web properties. Unfortunately, uh, what we found surprised us. Uh, in an industry that cares a lot about standardized metadata and standardized schemas, we found a real significant lack of consistency in rights metadata schemas. For the most part, rights metadata today is found in some kind of free text field, usually in some kind of DC rights field, um, and it's really not useful. So without having a, a rights database pre-built for us, we ended up having to build our own and it's part of our metadata management system. In the right side of the MMS system, we record the provenance of how we acquired an object. Um, did we get any donor restrictions or any licenses that came with that acquisition? Did we secure any licenses that we can record subsequent to the acquisition of that material? Um, let's, we also wanna record the information and research that's useful to determining the copyright status of these assets. And we also wanna note how the object can be used so it can be programmatically actionable by NYPL's digital properties. We do all of that by entering data into the rights database, which is part of this system. Oops, uh, so we didn't start out recording copyright status determinations. Uh, five years ago, we made educated guesses about what the copyright status might be and, and what we can do with those assets and reviewed each object for those uses. But after a few years, it became really clear really quickly that we weren't going to be able to predict every single use NYPL wants to make of a digital asset. So we needed to find another way to classify these assets in our repository. So thanks to HathiTrust's rights database, we could see the potential applications for recording the copyright status determinations and making them into a programmatically actionable uh, statements. So about three years ago, we began evaluating and recording copyright status determinations in our database. Unfortunately, determining copyright status uh, and, and determining what is in the public domain isn't so tricky. There isn't some magical database in the copyright office across the street that has a registry of all things in the public domain. So without that official database of identified works in the public domain, uh, we had to do the same thing. We had to build our own. So we've had to make those determinations ourselves. Luckily, we've got some really good tools, some really helpful tools to make the law easier to walk through. Um, but those tools are really only as good as the factual information we have on hand. Um, unfortunately, we're often missing important information to help us uh, make a high confidence determination about the copyright status. Take, for example, this, uh, this letter from 1879 written by Samuel Clemens. Um, although this letter appears to be in the public domain for some very quirky reasons in copyright law, it's actually uh, in copyright because of the publication of it during a certain magical uh, time. <laughs> So it's really difficult uh, just looking at an archival item to determine whether that item was subsequently published or is in copyright today. That's the problem we've struggled with with archival material. So I started five years ago and my team's assignment has been to review the last 10 years of digitization at NYPL as well as keep up with the going forward digitization. Um, so here's my team uh, at NYPL. We've got our team researching, analyzing, and entering rights information. Um, there's me, uh, there's a guy named Kiowa Hammonds, and that's it. <laughs> so although we're a really small team, we've been averaging about 1,000 captures a day at this point, determining and adding copyright status information to those, those captures. And by capture, I mean a single page in a book or a photograph. Um, but it, it, we're adding about 1,000 captures a day. And this is our burn down chart. Uh, it's, it's, this is our internal tracking of how fast we're moving through our database. Since May of 2014, we've added copyright status determinations to about 640,000 captures. And of the database, we have 17% left to review and add statuses to. We think we're gonna get through that in, uh, by, in the next six months or so. We're hoping that the, uh, the rest of it is gonna be as, as uh, straightforward as the previous, we'll see. So of the 847,000 items we've digitized, we believe at least 196,000 are in the public domain. And by public domain, in this case, I mean no known US copyright restrictions. Uh, the New York Times described that phrase as a wonky phrase, <laughs> and we agree. Um, but there's a reason why we had to say, we didn't want to say public domain at this point. And in part because we wanted to be a little more accurate than that. And there's two problems with just saying public domain and leaving it at that without some reference to something else. Um, first, there's no, uh, first, this 
public domain determination is inherently limited to the country's law that you're applying it to. There is no international copyright law, and instead we've got a patchwork of individual countries' laws. So we had to limit this down to US copyright because that's the only law that we uh, evaluate under. Second, we also wanted to be clear that we've only evaluated copyright issues, not other kinds of issues like trademark or rights of publicity. So we wanted to be clear about that, and that's why we use the phrase no known copyright restriction, no known US copyright restrictions. But today, with the launch of rightstatements.org, um, we are going to be switching over our wonky phrase to one of the three public domain options that's out there today. Wait, so with this foundation of copyright information and copyright status determinations, uh, the library felt really comfortable about, making the risk, about, about the risk issues and making this high resolution release happen. So after working with the director of the library, she ended up approving the high resolution release of these images, and that's why we have 197,000 up. And one other note about bibliographic metadata that's relevant to copyright issues, um, copyright doesn't protect factual information, and most of the bibliographic data in our repository is just that, it's just facts. However, to the extent that there is any kind of copyright in the metadata we have, we've applied a CC0 uh, waiver, we've waived our rights uh, under, under copyright to that information. All right, so my team will continue to review the digitization and chip away at our backlog. Uh, and we'll keep knocking down that, that number as, as low as we can get. I'll hand it over to Shane now. Great. So we've got our copyright house in order. We've uh, enhanced our access to our API and data. We've turned brighter lights on in digital collections to the public domain items. Um, next up is how do we go about like revving these engines for reuse? Um, the first way we did this was issuing um, a formal call for um, a, what we're calling an NYPL Labs Remix Residency. Um, this is including a stipend, uh, and two people will be chosen, um, and it includes a stipend, the opportunity to consult with library experts on projects, the opportunity to work in the library at one of our research study rooms, and to showcase what's made um, at NYPL um, through this program. In issuing this call for you know, sort of remixing um, these public domain works through this residency program, we're really building on a tradition that the library has had for, in many research libraries have, of supporting scholars and researchers in the creation of new works um, through offering sort of special space and consultation opportunities and sometimes um, stipends to do that kind of work. And we know that at labs, we wanna sort of bring that um, core mission forward and apply it to the creation in a digital context. We're also building on a, something that we prototyped last year, a net artist residency that we launched in collaboration with Electric Objects, a startup that creates screens for the display of digital art. We paired this with um, a prior public domain release we had done with our cartographic works um, back in 2014, and we positioned those open access maps as source material for new creations. Uh, through a competitive review process, we chose Jenny O'Dell, um, as the winner of this residency. And she's a San Francisco-based artist who works with Google satellite imagery and creates really amazing digital collages. Here you're seeing a collage that she created out of shipping containers. Here's one of crop circles. And so she kind of crops these and sort of rearranges them and really plays with perspective and scale in really interesting ways. Um, for our residency with uh, her and electric objects, she took, um, she took an interest in the decorative elements on the borders of 17th and 18th century Dutch maps and created this series of collages um, that uh, kind of apply her methodology but to these um, historical works. To round all this out, um, we had an artist talk um, at the map division uh, in NYPL and this work is on display still in our map division. So again, this is really what we are trying to drive at with our remix residency and really opening this up to the fuller um, sort of public domain release uh, overall. To round all of this out um, and to kind of continue to drive attention to that residency, that call for proposals for the residency, um, and also to kind of continue to communicate about the public domain release for the months or the, for the weeks and months um, after the January drop date. Um, we wanted to also sort of have our staff uh, be blogging about particular collections and also position those collections for you know, different kinds of users, so educators um, or creatives, um, things like that. So that was good. That should have been enough. Um, and December 2015, like that's where we were. 
At the same time, though, our developers and our R&D team were busy um, kind of working on some elective hack projects, um, some really cool demonstrations of the, the in kind of like using the data and um, coming up with some new projects that really demonstrated sort of both what people could apply to do with the Remix residency, but also just to really provide some like new ways to kind of explore and experience um, these really rich assets that we had in this collection. So, uh, Josh is gonna take you through, you know, how we really like put the pedal to the ground in revving these engines for reuse and sort of talk about these uh, hack projects. Okay, these are fun. Um, the developers had a lot of fun doing these. As Shana said, these were kind of born out of personal interests, right? So they sort of found the, the segments of the public domain release that were, that were of interest to them or spoke to them and then built some projects on top of these. And, uh, and that's part of why we kind of held the release to be able to include these with that to show kind of the passion projects and what can come out of the, the public domain um, collection of materials that we were offering. So um, there's three of these projects I'll talk through and then kind of a fourth overarching one that, that was more of a visualization of the entire body of stuff. Um, this first one, Mansion Maniac, uh, is, takes as its source materials um, a neat uh, publication from the early 20th century that was uh, these, these beautiful floor plans of these massive New York City apartments, right? These like grand, elegant named buildings uh, and showed all the different rooms, right? The, the parlors and the maids' quarters and the libraries and all of the entrances uh, and each room in the square footage and all of that. And the developer kind of cut these apart and then created an interface. And I'll show you the interaction in just a second that allowed you to tra traverse from one room to another with a little sprite character um, and, and see how many different rooms you could chain together as they're sort of randomly composed by um, connecting the portals to the different rooms. Um, so you start always at the entrance to one of these grand buildings. Let's see, I can't actually see if it's working. Is that working? And so you sort of wander around, right? Some of the hallways, sometimes it's uh, a kitchen, sometimes you chain together a couple of different hallways. Um, I can't exactly see where the sprite is in the process, but some of these you can you can some of you end up chaining together and there's almost a game like element where people have competed to see like how large an apartment you can create especially since most of us live in shoebox style apartments this is kind of like a fun um, little way of, of you know a fantasy lands apartment building um, project so that's mansion maniac um, another one that takes uh, a similar era of source material um, is uh, street view then and now new york city's fifth avenue and so there's a publication from 1911 that took uh, that published wide-angle uh, images of every block of Fifth Avenue from Washington Square Park to what became Marcus Garvey Park up in Harlem. Um, so images of every block and then essentially just juxtaposes the 1911 view with uh, Google Street View um, and adds a few engagement uh, or interaction opportunities to um, navigate from one side of the island to another and switch around uh, sides of the street and you can kind of view um, many of the buildings that are still there, many of them that have been remodeled or torn down as the skyline has changed and uh, all aspects of Fifth Avenue have um, kind of updated over those 104 years, is that right? 100 and, yeah, 104 years. Um, so, two kind of more playful interventions, but there was a third that actually took the historical materials in our public domain release and um, injected it into the conversation about ongoing racial inequality in the country. Um, this one takes as its source material um, a set of publications called the Green Books, which were published from 1936 to 1967 and were each year listings of places like hotels and restaurants um, that were welcoming to black travelers uh, as they traveled the country in an era of Jim Crow laws and uh, sundown towns. Uh, and so there are, there's an element here where each of the listings we were able to extract from the, the, to do some OCR processing and extract the listings and place them on a map. So there's kind of a cluster view, um, but there's also a, a, a tool I'll show you in just a second that allows you to kind of apply modern mapping technology, right? Sort of Google map style path creation using just the listings from these volumes. Um, and so as you take a look at the hopefully working interaction here, we uh, were able to get two volumes done. So we have 19 data from 1947 and data from 1956. And this is actually another kind of neat example of, of cultural heritage cross promotion. Um, the 1947 volume, oh no, sorry, the 1956 volume is actually data extracted from that volume from the University of South Carolina. So we were able to use their data from that volume merged with our data from 1947. 
Um, and this has proven to be like a, a really popular tool just to see the listings as well as uh, we've heard about uses in classrooms and all sorts of things like that. Um, the final piece, the final project, I guess, um, was meant to answer kind of the sub-question about this 187,000 items. The question of how do you help people even look at 187,000 items? Uh, so this was a visualization um, experiment uh, in giving access to those, and it creates uh, a sprite, a little tiny thumbnail for each one of the 187,000 items, and gives uh, a couple of different browse paths uh, to sort them, and then click through from each image um, thumbnail to the item page on our digital collections platform. Uh, and so you can see here, there are four different ways of sorting them. You can sort by date created, um, pulling metadata from the underlying objects. There's also a way to sort using the genre terms from the metadata. Um, but the final example up on the screen is, is kind of a neat one that used um, the average color value of the image and was able to sort those. Um, so what we don't see in that example is um, the fact that you know, something like 60% of the collections are yellow or brown, right? It's the problem of the 19th century. Um, everything is the same color. Um, and so this is kind of the, the set of material that we were able to put together and wait till January to release all together to really give those kind of shining examples of what we did with the materials and hopefully set kind of the bar for what we were hoping other people would do um, with the exact same body of materials. Okay. So... How did the public respond? Um, I'm going to start with some uh, sort of an overview of press responses. Um, first up was a really amazing feature in the New York Times um, that really kind of went through every sort of aspect of, uh, of our release. Um, it really even started out with Mansion Maniac, um, which kind of really validated like our strategic choice to kind of package all of this up together. Got a shout out to Dan Cohen for giving us an amazing quote. Thank you for blurbing our public domain release, Dan. Um, and then from there, um, this, yeah, um, from there, like this, the the news um, was just really kind of a flood. Like we had every like over a hundred news outlets have really picked up the story. Everything from national news outlets like Washington Post, um, the Atlantic, PBS NewsHour, um, local news um, in the U.S., um, all kinds of outlets like really sort of finding their own sort of uh, collections, like things that represented their localities in our collections. The same thing with international news outlets. Japan, Russia, Singapore, India, and many more sort of finding that sort of story and that representation in our digital collections. Um, and uh, some of them were really putting history in the context of the present. This is one of my favorite examples. Uh, what would Beyonce's formation might have looked like if it were set in the 1930s? Um, so kind of pulling in some photographs from um, the FSA um, to kind of like illustrate what uh, a sort of historical version of that video would be. Um, more seriously, uh, PRI's The World um, took uh, 19th century um, photographs of Ellis Island that were, uh, of Ellis Island immigrants that are in our digital collections and juxtaposed those with those of contemporary Syrian refugees to really sort of draw some sort of commonalities between um, these, these, these uh, this, you know, across time. Um, and that was really amazing to see. Um, also, the public kind of went nuts on the internet. Um, people comparing our digital release, or our public domain release with uh, the biggest drop of Beyonce and this is the first time and only time I've re referenced Beyonce twice in a presentation. So thank you for giving me this chance. Um, also got some great kudos from Corey Doctorow, um, a great open access advocate who uh, gave us a nice pat on the back. Um, and then like, it turned out that we had sort of developed um, like everyone's favorite procrastination machine. Um, so people are getting like lost in the collections, they're getting um, addicted to sort of exploring and browsing. I think our visualization tool was a big engine of this. Um, landladies in uh, rural Vermont are, uh, you know, sort of trying to bribe Jessamine West, um, one of our librarian colleagues, with fudge to help her find public domain items. Um, as Josh mentioned, people were really enjoying sort of sharing out um, their generative, um, their, their generated sort of mansions using Mansion Maniac. Um, memes uh, start getting created. I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. Um, gift making, actually one of our gift makers is in the audience, Derek, thank you, um, make, made the, this one I'm showing right now, yes? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then also we issued um, a call, or, or just uh, issued a hashtag really for any sort of examples of organic reuse that were, were coming about. Um, we've seen hundreds of uses of this hashtag and Red Peel Remix on both Instagram and Tumblr, I encourage you to explore those. 
including um, one of our favorite examples of some guy in Williamsburg who's been um, remixing public domain images and using them on skateboard decks um, and like selling those, which has been really kind of fun to see. So like that, check those out. Um, illustrators, designers drawing a lot of inspiration for their own creative works uh, from the collections. Um, a couple weeks after the release, we um, participated in a, a glam-wide sort of promotional effort called Color Our Collections. Um, we created a little coloring booklet out of a select um, 12 or so uh, images, uh, made those available for download and participated in this like sort of, like I said, this broader sort of uh, celebration of, of open materials. Um, and a user um, just created her own uh, coloring book as well out of Bernice Abbott's um, uh, photos. Uh, seeing some examples of reuse in the digital humanities community as well, I want to thank John Resig for teaching me how to say uh, paste C, um, the sort of tool that Ryan uh, Bauman is using to kind of do um, image recognition analysis across our open collections and those of uh, the Rikes Museum. And also Miriam Posner, a, a digital humanities professor, really excited about using these in her class. Um, our API has been used um, to create some Twitter bots, um, including uh, one by Sean Averkamp, a colleague in the, in the audience here today. The iClassify bot is hers. Um, and finally, another sort of category of response has been the um, response to the call for proposals. So we received uh, close to 300 applications by computer scientists, artists, uh, hacktivist collectives, educators, filmmakers, uh, design, uh, data visualization designers, um, muralists, uh, a well-known indie rock musician, uh, a designer of a classic video arcade game. Um, we're in the selection process right now, um, but we're so sort of thrilled by this response. Um, people are proposing new works as diverse as like transmedia narratives starring an army of bots, uh, immersive virtual reality experiences, scavenger hunts, animations, and the list goes on. Um, we're gonna be really excited to be sharing um, the results of that work in the coming months. And uh, to tell you, some, we, if no presentation will be complete without some numbers, so I'm gonna turn this over to Josh to give you a rundown of those. Okay, you wanted big numbers, you're gonna get big numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so this is my favorite, sort of an anecdotal piece, but in the first five weeks of the launch, right, January 6th, um, just into February, we had more traffic, more visits to our digital collections platform than we had in the entire calendar year of 2015. And, and previous to the launch, we had thought that the calendar year of 2015 was, was going pretty well. Um, so that was really edifying. Um, three months out, so January 6th to April 6th, um, we had 1.8 million sessions to the site, but we also um, had 3.2 million calls to our API, right? Trying to pull down the data. So it kind of confirmed our suspicion that, that, that both aspects of this were uh, desirable and being used. Um, we had 680,000 some downloads of assets from our digital collections platform, and 290,000 of those were of these kind of previously um, uncovered uh, high resolution assets that we were making available. Um, beyond that, right, so we're now 14 weeks out from the, the day of the drop, and we had a huge spike, uh, and then, right, as, as these things go, the traffic comes back down, uh, and it has come back down, but it hasn't come all the way back down. Um, we, every day, we haven't had a day that is, has been less than one and a half times the previous traffic. Um, so we're, we're feeling like that we're settling into a baseline of one and a half to two times increase in traffic. Um, there's been an ongoing 50% increase um, in pages viewed, 25% increase in the length of the session. So people, it, it, it sort of stuck, right? That's, that's the takeaway separate from the numbers is that um, this, this wasn't sort of a blip on the radar. This has um, had a lasting impression in, in terms of the way it's lodged into um, search results and, and traffic to our site. bring this on home with some takeaways um, and then leave some time for questions. So I guess for us, so, you know, obviously this, there's this huge demand for this stuff. Um, and like we knew it was going to be big, but like people really, really love this. We thought we were in the giving away free content business, um, but it turns out that we're really in like an audience development business, um, that we've really developed a huge sort of, um, yeah, audience uh, and, and people who not just are like looking at the stuff, but really want to use it. Um, what's going to be a challenge for us ahead is sustaining this like, demand and interest um, and you know, kind of continuing a sort of steady drumbeat of, of promotion and uh, for like, things that we digitize, things that, for, that Greg's team, his huge team, is, uh, is like, sort of clearing. Um, we're going to be soon approaching 200,000 public domain images, so like, these are new opportunities for us to kind of like, continue to share out um, about the public domain. 
uh, collections and, and position them for reuse. Um, and I also think a big takeaway for us has always also been to think of in a new way about our R&D capacity as a lab. These were like lightweight, rapid proofs of concept that demonstrate what can be done with open collections and data. And we just really feel like that they've um, were such a critical part of this release overall. And so that's something that we're gonna be really thinking about and sort of applying, I think, in the future um, for other projects. And finally, because we are here at DPLA Fest, um, if we you know, achieved what we did with NYPL collections, like sort of imagine like what happens when we're all like revving our engines for reuse and like as a collective, like as a community um, with, you know, as a DPLA. So thank you. Um, we have some time for questions. You guys wanna come up? Dan, no, Dan deferred to you. So we'll go oh. Derek and Dan. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Said, uh, <laughs> I thought that's, sorry, <laughs> misread the language. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so everything, uh, identifying things in the public domain was tricky and that was hard and because the Copyright Office doesn't keep a record of that, it was even harder. Um, I think doing things like this, demonstrating that we can identify things in the public domain and hopefully all of us using rightstatements.org statements, we're going to develop almost by accident but probably not, um, a, a public domain registry of cultural heritage items. And I think that, that there's some power in that, uh, of demonstrating what we think is in the public domain. Because what, what we expect is gonna happen is that things in NYPL's collections that we've marked as public domain are gonna be in your collections and you might be able to rely or want to rely on our determination so you can kind of move past that item. Um, in, a, in the context of a larger copyright policy, we are heavily engaged in those conversations in DC. We, I, I'm down here a lot. Uh, it's talked to, to Congress and to the Copyright Office about better copyright policy and, and not messing up what we've got right now. Um, I think that demonstrating the value of public domain is good when we start talking about whether we're going to exter extend copyright protection for another 20 years, um, if that proposal ever goes anywhere. Um, I think things like this, showing the value of the public domain will eliminate or hopefully reduce that argument. <laughs> what advice would you give? I mean, you, you have two other individual work that you have here at the DPLA and you have a, a, a book that you yourself uh, published for our um, for DC Museum of Modern Art and Science. What would you say to them as they go to the press to do this kind of work? Okay, so first step is start to identify your, your uh, <laughs> the things that are in the public domain. Um, and then... I mean, I guess, you know, I, th I think that, um, you know, thinking about collection strengths and thinking about audiences that might be interested um, and not the usual suspects. And I think that there's like so many different forms of that kind of like activation of this kind of content can take. Um, hosting hackathons, um, ho you know, inviting, um, you know, inviting artist commissions. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be something that's a co competition. It can be something that's a collaboration. I think like creating an experience around, like thinking about like what are sort of like interesting experiences that you can create around these these collections. And like I said, to they could take yeah several forms. I also want to shout out um, to Effie Kepsalis, um, who's here from the Smithsonian Institute Archives, who's just created this amazing. Um, case study of uh, institutions um, across the glam sector who have opened their materials and has like done a really amazing job of sort of like gathering sort of anecdotal and other kinds of data that's like sort of showing um, that uh, the, the impact and so that other institutions who are thinking about trying to do something like this will have that as like a really great tool. Effie, if you could like tweet that out. Yeah, great. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I would say like read Effie's report, get your copyright house in order, and like you know think about unique opportunities to activate those collections. Did you want to add anything? Uh, I was just 
I, you know, creating context around it, right? Like, like it's one thing to do, you know, we chose to do this kind of all, all in heterogeneous drop with 187,000 things, but we had considered doing more of a serialized approach and doing batches and collections, right? Yeah. And we did actually, the first one we did was 20,000 maps in 2014, and that actually, you know, was really powerful in its own way because it was able to be targeted and we were able to create yeah. context around it in its own way. So I think that could be another strategy, yeah. right? If, if, if it isn't necessarily the right way to do it with everything all at once, you can maybe serialize it and do, you know, if you produce smaller amount of materials with the right context, that, that'll help it sing. That'll help it reach the activation energy to, to probably extend even further. Okay, I give it to me. Um, so for now, I don't think we're going to be enabling high-res downloads of undetermined, uh, things that are undetermined. Uh, I, I think that for us, uh, although we like to push the envelope in some ways, we are still a little more conservative. Um, we don't have sovereign immunity. We, we are a private corporation, um, and uh, we report to a board. So uh, there's a, I think there's a little bit of a concern there with, with some of that material. I think, that though, that we can we're exposing more items that would have otherwise been kept in the dark by doing this rights review work. Um, things that are, you know, even things published as late as 1989, we've been able to make available online because we've been using the copyright law to identify them as public domain, or even orphans where we think that the work is an orphan work and we think that there's no potential for a lawsuit. I think we've been making those things available more broadly. So maybe not in the high res, but in, in a way that exposes that collection that in a way that we wouldn't have done that 10 years ago or even probably five years ago. Um, we felt more and more confident with, with fair use. Just to answer another part of your question of what's next, so another part of what's next is applying the rights statements that org, and I think we'll do that closely as soon as we can. Um, and beyond that, I think we're not racing to double the number, right? I think that, you know, that's not the goal. It's 2017, we need to now have 400,000 things. I think for us, you know, just adding more just to, like that, that is not necessarily the best thing to do for us. I think it's just more about continuing what we have been able to do about highlighting the like gems that have been digitized, you know, for 10 years. Um, there's a, a new project that we didn't build called Old NYC, which is not necessarily public domain photos, but, but photos from our collections that had been online for 10 or 11 years, but it was this mapping interface that really allowed them to sing. So helping, I think, identify those areas and maybe helping developers with whatever field access to those. So it's about activating maybe the stuff that we already did. So instead of doing a whole new release, just refreshing that and yeah, and I'll, I'll say too, just like from the, the reuse, um, sort of like the program aspect of this, like the sort of public outreach um, aspect, um, this idea of reuse um, is just so interesting to like our library overall, like both on the digital side of things, but also in the research library more broadly. So we're really interested in sort of starting to think about how do we, um, you know, continue to sort of tell the stories of how our collections are being used, the kind of interesting things that are being created out of them, be they, a, you know, an academic book, work of journalism or you know some kind of you know interesting like map interface to a you know a, a historic collection Telling the story, but this is kind of the perfect, um, the perfect kind of series of events. So it was proposed for digitization more than a year and a half ago, almost two years ago at this point, by a curator at the Stromberg Center, um, who who knew the history of the materials and had basically a complete one. I think we're only missing one volume, and had said we, we have to digitize these. They're kind of this amazing artifact, and we have the complete version of these. So we digitized them. We put them online. And again, they were online for a year and a half, and a few people saw them and, and maybe through them, but it wasn't the right format for use. Um, and so we had been talking to the curator and sort of this had been a back you know, burner idea for us. And then in the run up to the public domain release, 
that the developers built that and said, well, okay, this is what I want to spend a couple of weeks doing, and then actually worked with uh, a bunch of folks on the team to do this to track the same and the data extraction and all these different things. So that was a great example of you know, the idea that had been sort of waiting to activate getting um, taking the risk. And in terms of um, sort of long term sustainability, uh, like these these were I mean these were basically meant to be quick projects released as, as examples and, and there isn't kind of a like a you know they're published on GitHub. It's just GitHub mm -hmm. IO. It's not like there are servers that are running and a lot of infrastructure that's involved in keeping these. But we published all the code openly for all of those too. So it's that's not a sustainability mm -hmm. strategy but it is like a, a meant to be as an example, presented as an example, and hopefully other people can take up and, and use the same approach to them. So the second one first. Well, I don't talk to you know donors and the, there's a whole separate staff that does, but it, we know anecdotally it absolutely has. Just the, the response to this mm -hmm. has informed conversations that have been had about trying to acquire um, collections. And so that it, it just positively, you know, in basically as a case study for me. Um, and in terms of how it's informed digitization, like the conversation about what to select is is changing every week. You know, it's like it, we had already been talking about the primacy of public domain and, and how that really aligns with our mission before we did the public domain release. So I think that was already pretty well baked into what is, is usually selected for digitization, but it is absolutely informing and especially as we could get more data and more anecdotal use about um, what has really you know surprised us in terms of use and reuse. Um, it, it has, but it's hard to tell you exactly how that, um, you know, we have so many different streams that are feeding into what is desired to go into the frame. Should I out us? Yeah. I mean, yeah, Josh and I both have like shady pasts in publishing and so does our director, Ben Bushbell. And like, yeah. And I mean, I guess like part of my role is kind of helping the NYPL's like flagship social media channels kind of like activate what we're doing in labs. So it's like we're running our own social media. We have this whole, you know, sort of program design. Um, but a big part of what I, we like jokingly call it like the institutional hacking, you know, so it's like how do we, how do we make sure, because we, we don't like think of Facebook. I mean, this is just like another communication channel, Tumblr, Instagram, Twitter, and our channels have so many, so, like, or those flagship accounts have so many followers, and so that was a really critical part of helping to kind of, like, get the word out and, and sustain interest and, and even, I mean, we, uh, labs, like, I think our account is, like, 10,000 followers, like, that's good, but it's not, like, the scale, it's not web scale, you know, and, and the, uh, the NYPL accounts, I mean, if I'm answering your question um, appropriately, like, no, we don't see that that is, like, a bad way for people to be um, encountering these images or sharing them or if anything it was, it's like this very visible daily reminder that um, yeah people are just like enjoying just just the sharing you know like I, this is an amazing collection there's, there's this like uh, radio producer I think it's Science Friday 
who just has become obsessed with our, it's like every day he does like some sort of like like tweet storm of you know his favorite sort of science related tweets and like he's a fan you know and he's um, helping to kind of share with his audiences and that we see that as a really great outcome. All right, thanks. thanks for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.